Hello and welcome to the Elephant Lounge. I'm your host Tuesday. I want to thank you so much for joining me once again and we are going to dive back into the Michael Jackson case. Only this time what I will be doing is I will be painting a broad picture. I'll be taking all the pieces of the puzzle that I've covered in prior episodes, putting this all together so that we can definitively answer the question of whether Michael Jackson was indeed a pedophile. And we shall see that there is only one answer to this question, which is an affirmative yes. It is the only answer that makes sense of all of the information that we have, and we will do so in a reasonable and logical fashion. In the following episodes, that I am currently scripting. I will be going over other true crime cases. I'll be talking about a number of other true crime cases cases, and I will be discussing how to approach these cases and how cases are put together, how we look at things in a reasonable, logical way. I've discovered that a lot of people out there know what to think, but they do not know how to think, and that's what I will be doing. I will be helping you understand how to approach information in a logical manner, and this will also include a little bit about conspiracies, although I will be mainly focusing on true crime. I will also eventually cover a case where indeed a innocent person was convicted. And we will look at that case and learn about why that case fell apart and what the difference between that case is and And something like the Michael Jackson case, for instance, which is clearly a very solid case. So this week, we learn about Jeffrey Epstein and his suicide. And of course, there's a lot of conspiracies going around. But besides that, I do notice, even though he was convicted of pedophilia, there are no presence of groups of people on the internet who are proclaiming his innocence. Quite the contrary. It seems to be very much of a consensus that the man was guilty, although I believe there was pornography found, as well as testimony from his victims. And coincidentally, that's very similar to what we have uh, with Michael Jackson, which it behooves me to understand why there are still people out there who struggle with the question of whether Michael Jackson was indeed a pedophile. With Michael Jackson, unlike Jeffrey Epstein, we were continuously exposed to him being accompanied by young small boys and his special friends for many, many years. We also were aware that he was sharing his bed with these young boys alone. We have a span of a quarter century of sexual abuse allegations. So what evidence do we have? Let's go over all of this. And I'm going to discuss the circumstantial evidence. I'm going to discuss the physical evidence, all of the evidence evidence that we have, hopefully by putting this all together for anybody out there who's still questioning, if you are a reasonable, logical person, you will see what the rest of us all see. Allegations of Michael Jackson's pedestry go back to the early 80s. This begins with Emmanuel Lewis and some stories about Sean Lennon. Jordan Chandler and Jason Francia were both paid large sums of money in order to buy their silence. There is no denying their settlements as they are part of court record. In 2003, we have another allegation from Gavin Arviso that would be reported to authorities and later there would be a trial in 2005. We also find two more victims stepping forward. This is Wade Robson and James Safechuck. All of the boys were known to be with Michael during different periods of time. Their presence was well known and documented via the media and testimony. In addition to the more well-known cases, a girl identified only as Jane Doe would come forward. She had also received a settlement. Another lesser-known accuser who went public briefly was a dancer named Eddie Renoza. He claimed that Jack 
Jackson raped him when he was 16 years old, and I believe they met on the set of Thriller, or he had auditioned for Thriller. He's now retreated from the public altogether due to his fear of the public scrutiny and what he witnessed happened to other victims who stepped forward. We also have a young boy in Germany named Michael Jacobson who came forward eventually with a story about Michael Jackson being inappropriate and sending him a book of young naked boys. Jackson signed this book and it was later confirmed by a handwriting expert to be Michael Jackson's signature. Terry George is another young boy who came forward with his story from 1979. It was actually his friend who sold the story to the press and then later someone would interview him directly. And George was a young boy at the time. He went to Jackson's hotel room to ask to conduct an interview with him. They exchanged numbers and eventually the The result of their phone conversations would culminate to Jackson masturbating on the telephone. Also, I talked about Aaron Carter. He has said in taped conversations that Michael Jackson gave him, I believe, marijuana and alcohol. And he did recently come forward and make a statement about Michael Jackson being inappropriate with him one time. Unfortunately, he was viciously attacked by fans as are all of Michael Jackson's victims. He has not said anything since, so we shall see. Maids, guards, butlers, and cooks that I've talked about here on this program all have claimed at various times they witness inappropriate behavior between Jackson and young boys. This includes time at Havenhurst and later at Neverland Ranch. In particular, the boys named during these encounters include Jordan, James, and Wade, specifically named all victims who confirmed these instances did occur. James DeBarge, known as Janet Jackson's first husband, claimed to have witnessed inappropriate behavior. One boy in particular who was mentioned was identified as Sean Lennon. Another victim of abuse mentioned by him was Bubbles, the pet chimpanzee. Yes, even the chimpanzee. There is no denying Michael had a security system installed in his home, which concentrated on alerting him when someone approached his bedroom. He had both a bedroom and another room inside that bedroom, a secret room. Inside Inside his bedroom, police were led to pornography that was located through the word of his victims. This pornography also included three books in particular that contain child erotica. These books are noteworthy since they were created by by pedophiles for pedophiles. They are very popular among other child molesters since they are legal to own. And I still see Michael Jackson fans claiming that no, he didn't have child pornography. Child pornography and child erotica are two very different things. And I believe this might have something to do with the laws because I noticed that a lot of fans are not from the United States. They are from the UK or from different parts of the world where there are different laws. And I am unfamiliar with their laws, but to reiterate this statement once again, because it just keeps coming up again and again, if a child is merely naked in a book, it would be considered an art book. However, if those books are found via investigation of a child molester or child molesting accusations, it is then deemed child erotica. If the children are involved in sexual acts, then that would be considered child pornography. So these books are not child pornography. They are child erotica. That's what they are listed as. Nobody should be claiming it's pornography per se, but it is erotica. Without a doubt, most people are not going to own these books unless, of course, they're a pedophile. Now, you can certainly own an art book, for instance, If you're an artist or you're a photographer, that by itself would probably not be a big deal because no one would know that you owned those books. But if you are being investigated for pedophilia, wow, that's that seems to support a conclusion if you own these books. An individual 
picture of a naked boy was found among this material. Authorities believed this boy to be Jonathan Spence, another young boy who was known to have spent a long time alone with Jackson. So here we go. We have another child. Both Jordan and Gavin were evaluated by local authorities and top psychiatrists who dealt specifically with false accusations and were considered to be credible. Despite desperate shrieking and gnashing of teeth from Jackson fans, no evidence of extortion from Jordan's family nor Gavin's family was ever discovered. In addition to the allegations, we know Jackson fit the exact profile of a typical pedophile. He was never linked seriously with a woman. Only after paying out a settlement to Jordan and Jason did Jackson seek to alter his public image by rushing into an awkward marriage with Lisa Marie Presley. The marriage was so odd, his own fans did not believe it was genuine. And after the exchange vows, Jackson spent his nights with a young boy, leaving Presley in a location away from him. They divorced as quickly as they courted and married. Jackson would then be linked with a portly, unattractive woman named Debbie. Row. Ironically, this is a stark contrast from the usual good-looking little boys he normally surrounded himself with. This would also be a connection that fans and critics would dismiss as a real relationship. So nobody really believed that him and Debbie were an actual couple. Jackson would spend his time forming friends with the parents or parent of young boys. He would allow families to stay with him, keeping the parents in separate areas while he shared a room with their child. He would spend his time and money on the parents, paying for vehicles, homes, jewelry, vacations, other extravagant items. He eventually decided to purchase his own property called Neverland. He had a fascination with the childhood story character Peter Pan. He installed an amusement park and a zoo, which easily attracted children. Jackson was obsessed with children. Jackson exposed his special friends to pornography and gave them alcohol. Jackson's special friends mostly all came from broken homes where the father was not always present. Jackson had a general profile for the boys he took special interest in. They were generally between the ages of 7 and 13. Now, it should be noted here that pedophiles are interested in children, okay? The sex of the child does not always matter. Though Jackson himself did seem to prefer little boys, it is not outside the norm for a pedophile to deviate any time type of pattern, for instance. So while only one female victim has come forward, it is quite possible other girls were abused and it would make it even more difficult for them because in their case, Michael Jackson so far has demonstrated a greater preference for little boys. So the idea of a a young girl coming forward, that would be very difficult, especially when we consider how the fans treat these victims. It was very, very good of of her to to come forward. I'm glad that they were able to protect her identity. Also, while the known victims of Jackson all had long relationships with Jackson, there are many unconfirmed reports of children being molested, spending only one night with Jackson. It is unfortunate that because of the brevity of these encounters, it's impossible to prove these interactions took place. These all seem to be young boys who were runaways, troubled kids who had nowhere to turn, a perfect victim for pedophiles to take advantage of. Jackson used his fame and money to lure children and to cover up his pedophilia. A lot of these cases weren't investigated because it was very difficult for the police to go after Jackson. And without enough evidence or proof and going up against someone like Michael Jackson is almost near impossible. This is why we see celebrities and the very wealthy get away with their crimes for a very long time, or they might get away with them altogether. And like with Jeffrey Epstein, for instance, we had heard about Jeffrey Epstein for years before they ever went after him. And even when they did, he got a basic 
slap on the wrist. This last time around, even if he hadn't killed himself, I'm not so sure they would have really gone after him. When you're wealthy and you have celebrity, you can get away with a lot in this country, especially, unfortunately. Jackson also had very few friends who were inside his age group. His best known friendships were with older people and children. And the one relationship everyone talks about is Liz Taylor and him. And oddly enough, the staff at Neverland claim that Liz Taylor stayed alone, that she only ate dinner with Michael Jackson one time. So, so much for being such great friends. It seemed to be more of an arrangement of some sort that helped both of them publicly. While Jackson always had a public image that would be considered caring and loving, this image doesn't correspond with reality. Jackson bailed out of numerous business deals and took advantage of many people. He was known for making promises he could not or would not keep. He also took money from corporations and donated the money in his name only, claiming full credit, giving no credit to the actual sponsor. Jackson was sued multiple times by various artists who claimed he had stolen their material. Some of these people were longtime friends. Others were just small, independent artists who simply wanted credit for their work. Jackson's famous moonwalk was not his own. He would casually give credit to some dancers he claimed to have met, but this was not the truth. He knew exactly who taught him, Jeffrey Daniel. Overall, the deeper you dive, the more you discover that the image of Michael Jackson was only an image. Jackson was deeply concerned with only himself and his appearance. Jackson spent countless nights alone and in bed with children who were not his own. This is an undisputed fact. At his own trial in 2005, this was admitted by his own witnesses. Brett Barnes, Wade Robson, and Macaulay Culkin all testified to sleeping alone in bed with Jackson. Now, LaToya would come forward in 1993, discussing her concern of her brother and his continuing disturbing behavior in young boys. What I find most credible about LaToya is that she did not indulge or exaggerate any of her claims. She kept it very simple. She admitted she did not have any direct knowledge, but merely that she saw two checks. So there was no exaggeration. It was all a very straightforward discussion of what she knew and why she was concerned. At one point, she mentions by name James Safechuck as being one of many boys who share their time and bedtime with Jackson. Now, when we give all this information consideration, we have a portrait that can clearly be seen. Michael suffered from mental problems. This can be confirmed through his continued plastic surgeries and later on during his heavy use of drugs and alcohol. He was a man who had no boundaries. He never attempted to correct his behavior, even after paying out millions of dollars or standing a trial. So you think about being accused of something as heinous as pedophilia. Anytime you prey upon children or old people, these types of crimes are egregious because they are preying upon the most weak among the population. It is absolutely deplorable. So if you are being accused of this and you're innocent, one of the first things you're going to do is modify your behavior in such a way that would leave no ambiguity ambiguity for you to be accused again. And despite being accused publicly in 1993 and publicly in 2003 and having a trial in 2005, Michael Jackson continued to spend time with small children and sleep with them in his bed. Who but a pedophile would do such a thing? 
He had no boundaries when it came to children. Now, think about a person who loves children. If you love children and you care about children, you would take care of them. Let's say you're babysitting someone else's children for an evening. You care. You don't even have to love that child. You just care about that child because that maybe that's your friend's child. Maybe it's someone that you know. Most people generally recognize that they need to be taken care of. Now, if you're babysitting someone's child as an adult, you're the responsible one, correct? You are going to make sure that they get the meals that the parents wanted them to have. You're going to make sure that you put them to bed at a particular time. You're going to make sure that you don't overload them with sugar and other various things. That is not what Michael Jackson did. Michael Jackson allowed children to stay up as late as they wanted, have as much sugar and candy as they wanted. He did not care. That's not loving children. He may have claimed he loved children. In reality, he did not care. Grown adults set boundaries, and they set limits for children that they care about. Plain and simple, point blank. There are still those who protest. Why? Why? Jackson fans seem to bend, dodge, weave, and perform the most extraordinary mental contortions in order to excuse any action and any statement he ever made. Instead of looking at Jackson as they would any other man, they attempt to make excuses and live in this state of denial. They're not interested in facts. They're rather interested in the Peter Pan fairy tale they were sold so long ago. Only information that confirms their bias is accepted. They seem to find joy in attacking the many victims who have come forward, and any witnesses are dismissed as being not credible or they're lying for reasons which they cannot prove, ironically. So while they can afford any and all benefit of the doubt toward Jackson, they refuse any of the same for victims and witnesses. The cognitive dissonance is immediately exposed when they attempt to poke holes in any statements. Currently, they've been desperate to impeach Wade and James over what they perceive are inconsistencies or misstatements in their general testimonies. Meanwhile, anything Jackson said while he was alive is consistently excused or glossed over. What more information does a person need? People do not seem to understand the meaning of beyond a reasonable doubt. Reasonable being the operative word. One can have doubt on all sorts of things. I could have doubt about the sun existing. But is that a doubt of reason? No. That doubt would be considered absurd and obtuse by rational humans. Unfortunately, when it comes to the remaining Jackson fans, they have proven to be illogical and unreasonable. And this, of course, brings me to a recent comment that sort of irritated me, where someone had came onto one of my podcasts and said that they wanted to speak with me in a Skype conversation and that I was running from them. To which I have to say, I am not running from anybody. If you came on one of my podcasts and left me some stupid insulting comment that made absolutely no sense, and you still cannot figure out with all all the information, all the evidence, all the witnesses, you still cannot figure out that Michael Jackson was a pedophile. You are an unreasonable person. No, I'm not going to give my information to a Michael Jackson fan. No, I find many of you frighteningly ignorant, unfortunately. And I doubt I will get through to many of you, but maybe, maybe there's one person among you with enough cognition to figure it all out because you can't seem to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And that's what this is all about. And everything that I just mentioned, I have discussed in detail in my prior podcast. This is information that is available in the trial. This is information that has been reported on by various people who followed Michael Jackson. These are facts that cannot be denied. And no matter how many times you want to try and poke holes or insist that someone was inconsistent here, it's like that stupid train station. You show them, look, the guy built the train station before he got 
the permits. They just ignore it. These types of people, they don't care because it doesn't fit their bias. They dismiss it and flat out ignore it. They won't even acknowledge it. So the only comments that I get from Jackson fans are barely legible, first of all. Half of you can't even write in a cohesive or coherent manner, unfortunately, so it's very difficult to even understand what you're saying. Most of the time, it's just insults. Michael was innocent. Michael was innocent. That says nothing. You haven't addressed the entire case that's against him. There's so much evidence. And then on top of that, the lies. And we've gone over the lies. Now, if you're a Michael Jackson fan and you still can't figure out that he was a pedophile and you honestly believe this guy's innocent, then pray tell. Why would anyone need to lie? One of the biggest lies that really irritates me is the lie about the magazines and stating that Stan had contaminated the magazines in front of the grand jury. This was absolutely proven to be a lie at trial. Had you read the trial, you would know that the defense had to change their story. So do not Come here and tell me that you read the trial and repeat that lie because now I know you're a liar. And if you're lying, I need to know why you need to lie. Why do you need to lie in order to protect this so-called innocent man? I'll tell you why. Because you haven't read the trial. You don't know the facts. You don't care about the facts. You have an emotional reaction. You have reached a conclusion without looking at the totality of the evidence that is in front of you. And instead what you do, instead of examining the information, instead of looking at all of this in a logical, reasonable manner, you attack victims. You attack witnesses. You attack all of the people who are bringing truth and light to what has happened here. Michael Jackson was a garbage human. And I don't say that about too many people because we all got good and we all got evil. But my goodness, this man was evil evil to his core. It didn't matter whether he was dealing with adults. It didn't matter if he was dealing with children. He treated people like crap, period. He was a pedophile. He was the lowest of the low of humanity. And for some reason, for some reason, through the power of media, through the power of hypnosis, I guess you could say, brainwashing, people have been duped. And we've seen this before in society. Michael Jackson is not the first person to dupe millions upon millions of people. We can look at people like Hitler, Mussolini. There are a number of people in history who fooled masses of people. Michael Jackson is not the first and he will not be the last. There's many who have performed these hoaxes. Charles Manson, for instance. Some do it on a very broad scale, like Michael Jackson. Some do it on a very smaller scale, like certain cults, Scientology, we know about. This is not something that hasn't happened before, but we need to be able to recognize it. And the only way we can recognize it is by looking at all of the information and understanding how it all correlates with one another. And that Michael Jackson was still a human being. The rules of psychology still apply to Michael Jackson. If you have a person who behaves like a pedophile and has had multiple allegations over many, many, many years with many witnesses at some point, or should I say, at what point is it going to take for you to realize wait a minute, there's only one answer that makes everything fit together. And that is Michael Jackson was indeed a pedophile. I am ending this here and I hope you join me for my next episode. And I'm going to start with the topic of propaganda. We're going to talk about how to recognize propaganda. What information can we learn from propaganda? What should we dismiss and a host of other topics that will come out in subsequent episodes. And I do hope you join me and I will be back. 